Hi folks, I'm Rich Bilt and I'd like to take you on an adventure. Hi folks, I'm back with part four of my devlog about building an immersive sim in Go.4. Now I have my core systems working nicely together with one another, and because I was asked so nicely in the comments by Wide Art Shark, uh, check out his Go. channel by the way, in, uh, link in the description, I can talk in more detail about them and the code that makes them tick. I mentioned in my waffly first video about terrain and entities and components. I'll try and be a bit more succinct now. Uh, now that I'm not talking and thinking and typing at the same time. These systems I'm building aren't restricted to 3D either. They all just work as nicely in 2D as well. At the very top level, I split my game objects into two broad categories, terrain and entities. Terrain is anything in the game world that is static and non-interactive and usually built from a static body. It's there just to provide something with the player to look at, stand on or bump into. It's the stuff the game doesn't have to think about once the game's running. Examples of terrain include things like walls, floors, scenery, props like fixed furniture, pipes and other greeblies. Everything else in the game is an entity and usually built from a physics body. Examples of entities include the player, movable furniture, en enemies and crafting components. A destructible wall would be an entity. Out of the box, an entity is just a node. It's a holding place for something in-game that does something other than just look pretty. Because we extend from node, we can add this class to any node in the scene tree, even control nodes. Entity itself doesn't care what kind of node it's attached to. Entities can be children of other entities too. This is starting to sound a bit creepy. Um, it has one property, it's human friendly name. This is what the player and other entities will see whenever they interact with the entity. What gives an entity power though are components. You're already familiar with components though. A mesh instance node is a component you add to your physics bodies to give them a visual presence and the collision shape component gives your physics body a physical presence. Components are specialised nodes which can be attached to any entity and give that entity new abilities and behaviours. So the first thing they do is get a reference to their parent and tell the parent that they're available. And here's a core rule of the system. Components must always be a direct first child of an entity and they will throw an error if they aren't. An entity needs to expose those components it has to other entities and also allow other entities to interact with it via those components. So let's add some interface methods to allow other entities to do that. Get component allows other entities and components to see if an entity has the, that component or not and returns a reference to it so it can interact with that component. Get interaction works exactly the same for interactions, which are a specialized kind of component we'll get to in a little bit. Interact is how other entities interact with this entity. It does this by passing each action being attempted to every interaction component the entity has in turn until one of them handles it or none of them do. It then reports back to the entity interacting with this entity whether or not the action has been handled. That doesn't make much sense without context, so let's build a reusable door scene and see how the entity and component relationships tie together. The root node is an area 3D with a collision shape in which another entity is considered close enough to interact with the door. Inside that is the door model, the thing that opens and closes when we open and close it via the animation player. So far, nothing unusual. At this point, you might now go and add code to your door node to make the scene work and the door open and close. Components are a method to take all that door specific code and consolidate it into a one small neat reusable package. Opening the door is just the same as opening a box or a letter or even an inventory under the hood. 
Here I've taken all the code that's usually necessary to handle opening a door and created a container interaction component, which you can give to any entity that needs to be opened and closed. I've also added an optional lock component. It's a nice example of the components of an entity communicating with each other. There's a little bit more to these components than regular components though. They need to be able to deal with interactions from other entities. So let's set up a base interaction class and some stub functions to define that interface. As we're a specialised component, we make sure that we run our component setup before we run our own. This includes getting a reference to the parent entity. We then register ourselves as an interaction with our parent entity. GetActions will return a list of human readable actions that can be performed on the entity in its current state, keyed by their, their associated input actions. CanInteract will check if the inter entity interacting with this interaction is actually capable of interacting with this interaction. It will become more clear later. And the interact method will deal with what happens when the ent entity does actually interact with the component. So now that we've set up the interface for interactions, we can flesh it out in our containers interaction. We first declare a few signals that other components can listen out for, and next is the property that tracks whether or not the door is open or not. We also keep a reference to an optional lock component. A reference to the animation player is used to open and close the door, and a few variables that allow us to customise the animation so that we can make some doors different to other doors. I've overridden the set if it is open so that when it's set to true, the animation plays the open animation if it's set. It's optional because not all things will have an animation associated with opening them. The player's inventory, for example. It then emits the open signal so that any listeners can react. If it's set to false, we play the animation in reverse and emit this close signal instead. So, how will the player interact with the door? They need a way to toggle that is open variable. But first, we need to let them know what state the door's in and whether or not they can toggle it or not. GetActions checks the state of the door and builds a list of actions that can be performed on the door. You'll notice it's not concerned whether or not the entity can interact just yet, it just lists what can be done right now. So if the door is open, the only action available would be to be closing it. And likewise if it's open, and likewise open if it's currently closed. So we use that list of actions to tell the player what they can press, for example E to open the door. Now we need a way to handle that E key press. Remember that interact method in the entity that runs through all of its interactable components like this one and passes it the input invents? This is where we capture them. It takes a reference to the entity that's doing the interaction and the action that they're trying to perform. Firstly, it needs to check the interactor entity has everything needed to interact, which it checks using the can interact method. In the case of the door, it checks to see if the optional lock component is locked. Back in interact, if they can interact, that is, the door isn't locked. We check the interaction is one of the interactions we can handle. In the door's case, there's only one interaction to check, the open action. And if it is, we toggle this open flag, which in turn triggers the setter to play the animation to emit the correct, and emit the correct signal. Let's have a quick look at the lock interactable whilst we're here. You'll notice it follows the same pattern as the container component, which is unsurprising as they're both really just got switches under the hood. Here, however, the door needs to check that the entity trying to interact with the lock has a key. So we need a reference to that entity's inventory component that we'll fetch later. The setter for is lock works the same as is open on the door, except it doesn't play an animation and signals if it's been locked or not. Next is a reference to the optional key that locks it. I won't go into the item quantity details here. I'll cover that when I do the inventory stuff instead. Suffice to say for now, it stores what kind of key, key item opens the lock and how many of those items are needed to open the lock. Why more than one key? 
Imagine a door that needs 100 units of electricity to open. The key unit item is a, a unit of electricity and the quantity is 100. If the entity trying to unlock has only 20 units of energy, the door is unlockable. Like get actions in the door, here we return a list of actions that can be performed on the lock. In the case of the lock, if there's no key, there's nothing the entity can do, so we return an empty list. If there is a key, we return a prompt helpfully telling the entity which key it is and how many of them they need. When a lock is interacted with, its interact method is called. The lock first needs to check to see if the entity trying to unlock it can unlock it. It does this by calling the can interact method that does the checking. It does that first by seeing if the entity doing the unlocking has an inventory and if they do, if they have the requisite key and, quant and quantity. Back in Interact, if they do, we can toggle it's, it's locked, just like is is open in the, on the door. This triggers the setter, which signals out to the, the new state of the door, the lock, sorry, to any listeners. Now that that bit's set up, we can make a final tweak to the door component that says, if we have a lock and it becomes locked, close the door. Let's have a look at the interaction pop-up the player sees when they're trying to interact with something. Here's the code that builds a list of actions to display to the player. It starts by filling in the title of the pop-up by grabbing the display name of the entity being interacted with. Then it runs through every interaction component on the entity being interacted with, in this case the door, and gets a list of the available actions. It then runs through each of those actions to check if the player has what's needed and if not, it greys out that option. The rest of the code activates and shows the pop-up to the player in the correct place. When it comes time to pass the interaction from the player to the door, the code is simple. This is in the input event for the player. If we're currently pointing at an entity that has one or more interactions, pass the current input action to the entity we're looking at. If that entity returns true, it means our interaction was successful and we can signal the rest of the engine that the input has hand been handled. We then refresh the interaction panel because we've just interacted with the entity and its interaction options will now have changed. And we set our internal reference to the current entity to null just in case the action we've performed removed the entity from the game. Well, I hope that's answered any questions you might have. If not, let me know and I'll see if I can go into some more detail about it. There should be another show and tell video coming out shortly. Um, I'd also like to talk a bit about plot and game, uh, but I think I'm going to have to write that down first to stop me waffling. As always, thank you for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe. I also post fairly regularly updates on Blue Sky, so give me a follow on there too, please. There's still plenty more to explore. See you next time.